together, take our responsibilities uh, soberly and uh, with maturity as elected representatives and get out with a sensible deal. And as I was saying, that there, there are various elements that we have to get right. Uh, yes, I think we should disaggregate the provisions on citizenship and there are some other things that you, we could do unilaterally and in a, a super erogatory way, the things we could pass through our House of Commons and, and we should. And there's and things, sensible things on, on Gibraltar or, or whatever. Then, 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 of course, there is the question of the money. And that is, that is, that is difficult. And people will expect us to pay the 39 billion. Do you accept we have to pay some of it? Uh, I, I, I think it's important that as the UK is negotiated, we should retain some creative ambiguity about the, uh, the money and until such time. Until such as a country, if we commit to something, and we are legally obliged to pay, pay at least part of it, what does it say if you leave that in constructive ambiguity? I think what it says is that this is a country that is determined to conduct itself in accordance with the tradition of EU negotiations. Because... <laughs> Negotiation that uh, did not climax with the financial settlement. One of the most eccentric features of our negotiating style over the last three years is that we decided to anticipate uh, that uh, you were in the that, 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 more, that. that denouement and to put the money uh, across the line first. And, and, and actually, you, you, you raise a very important point, and one of the earliest things that, uh, against which I protested in cabinet was this, this curious decision to put the money in first. But if you could the most persuade Theresa to... May, how are you going to persuade the EU? Uh, well, uh, I was, uh, I was as, as you know, in, in, our, in our system, uh, the Prime Minister is primus inter pares, and uh, the, there was a, it was difficult to persuade not only her, but uh, the rest of the cabinet, from my point of view. I hope very much that with gung, the kind of gung-ho spirit that you have shown, <laughs> I think I'm going to be that in, secretary. In, in, <laughs> with, the kind of, with the kind of determination. The Department for Climate Change Issues, for example. I think, you know, gestures are very important. Let me tell you what I've done as Foreign Secretary. I've campaigned for the UK to host the next big climate change conference it's called COP26. It'll uh, be the end of next year. Emissions uh, by flying into London in their private well, jets. Yes, that's <laughs> certainly true. Um, but, but as a result of the Paris climate change uh, deal five years ago, there has been a very big reduction in uh, emissions and an increase in people's commitments. So I've been championing the UK holding that. We had a big breakthrough last week when Italy, which is one of our competitors, agreed to come in behind us and support a UK presidency. So I think there's something that all government departments can do, and I'm, I'm doing my bit. Um, when you were Culture Secretary back at the beginning of the coalition government, um, you were responsible for this decision to put the uh, free TG licenses for the over 75 onto the BBC. Um, what's your view about what should be done now? Because there's been a lot of anger throughout the country about what the BBC has done, but you effectively made it their decision. Well, I gave the BBC a licence fee settlement. By the way, that was a deal that I negotiated in less than 24 hours, that's the BBC licence fee settlement, and I'm not promising to do that with Brexit. I think it may take a little bit longer than that. And I gave them enough money in that settlement to fund uh, free TV licences for the over 75s. Um, in subsequent settlements, they've decided that they don't have enough money to do that. And my concern about that is that we promised in our manifesto to protect pensioner benefits. And if over 75 lose that benefit, they would feel that's a breach of our commitments. So I'd honour that commitment. But why should the BBC be responsible for welfare policy?